Great to see you. Thank you for having us. And it's an honor to be here on the uh, 10th uh, anniversary of DLD. Uh, as as uh, you may know, we started Real Networks 20 years ago next month. Uh, so we are also having our 20th anniversary. And it's very uh, meaningful to me to, to come here and be here today with you. Uh, and as Steffi said, we, we made uh, an announcement or making an announcement here about uh, something that's very near and dear to us, which is the uh, tied to the future of video. Uh, I wanted to step back in our, our time today, and as you know, the DLD sessions are famously short, and we go from undersea exploration to the world of internet video. Uh, I would argue that internet video is also something that connects us all, uh, in, in perhaps not the same uh, liquid way as the ocean, but I would argue equally pervasively. In fact, uh, it, it, the estimates are that if in three years, 2017, 70% of the internet traffic, uh, nearly three quarters of the internet traffic will be video uh, in terms of the, the quantity of it. So there's this massive explosion that has already taken place and is continuing to accelerate in the next three or four years uh, that will make the, uh, uh, what we're seeing today, which is certainly a, a river of video content, turn into a torrent and I would argue even an ocean of internet video. It's just incredible the rate of progress. Now, if you actually break it down, uh, the, 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 the role of uh, video, there's really two different kinds of video that are pouring together to form this, this massive change. And I think one of the fascinating things is that they're merging and they're coming together and the differences between them are getting much, much uh, more subtle and uh, complicated. Of course, there's professional video, which you think is video that is made for commercial purposes, for distribution on film or on television, uh, and uh, obviously all kinds of physical formats in addition to broadcast formats. And then, of course, there's the personal video, which is this, this, this phenomenon that, of course, has exploded uh, so dramatically. But in my view, is in addition to personal video having exploded over the last few years, that explosion has blurred the two because it's ended up creating all these different usage scenarios that are totally different. Uh, a friend of mine, Chase Jarvis, who a number of you may know, uh, once famously said, the best camera is the one you have with you. Well, we live in a world today where all of us have a camera with us all of the time. Uh, and that just isn't just people wearing Google Glass, although that may be the most obvious. It's everybody who has a phone. Uh, and that phenomenon of literally every moment is captured or can be captured on video from multiple perspectives changes everything in terms of the relationship between uh, the, uh, the creator and the producer and the, and the consumer, and the relationship between being a, a speaker and being a member of the audience. It has dramatically transformed the entire experience of video in a way that I think is going to continue to complicate and enrich and also blur those lines between commercial production and the other. You especially see that when you look at a lot of the sophisticated devices, like the GoPros of the world, uh, when you look at something like the Cousteau Mission and the kinds of cameras they're gonna have with them, you have all these devices that are both consumer products in that anybody can go on and put a GoPro on when they wanna go skiing, and the pros are using those same products. When you go and, and talk to uh, people that are making these professional broadcasts, they're using the very same equipment. It's, it's people talk about the consumerization of IT, and that's a real phenomenon. One the amazing thing that's happened is the consumerization of video production so that the same technology that has become so advanced on the consumer side is actually becoming the backbone for a lot of the production of commercial video. So yet again, you see an example of these worlds coming together. There is a very big difference, though, between the world of commercial video and personal video, and it actually has to do not with technology per se, but with distribution. Because commercial video is created around a commercial model, uh, most of the major uh, uh, companies that distribute commercial video make a rule that anybody who's doing business with them has to wrap that video in this uh, package called DRM, uh, which will be known, is known in the industry as digital rights management, but uh, in the consumers, it, it basically is known as the shit that means makes my video not work. And it's really a big deal, it's really a big problem because uh, what's happened in this initial phase of the market is Every DRM format is manufacturer specific. So Apple has one that's specific to iTunes. Amazon has one that's specific uh, to, uh, to their, their, their device and their players. Google the same. And that, is, that, that isn't just manufacturers being pernicious, that, uh, that, although certainly there is some lock-in element to this, but it starts with the, the content uh, industry, the distribution industry that believes that this is a necessary requirement. 
And now in the world of fixed function consumer devices like a DVD player, uh, this was actually, could be implemented in a way that did not create compatibility problems. But in this emerging world of richer and richer digital devices, it's kind of becoming a disaster. Um, and it's a disaster that has negative impacts on the commercial side as well as for the consumer. Because if consumers think that they've bought something, but it doesn't work everywhere they want it to work, that creates a backlash. And you know, in a world where there's only the iPhone or there's only one brand of device, that's okay. But if you bought a library of content and all of a sudden you decide you want to switch to an Android phone because the Android phone has a better rate plan or a bigger screen or one of a number of reasons, and all of a sudden you find out all that video you bought on iTunes, you just can't play. Your reaction is going to be, and this is happening increasingly, your reaction is going to be that you're screwed, that the, that the content industry or the manufacturer or somebody screwed with you because you thought you, bought, you owned it. You thought you, you paid the good money to have a digital copy of it, and yet you're locked into something. So people, I think there's a, 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 a going to be a, a, a brewing storm that's going to get more and more significant over the next several years. Now, on the personal video side, uh, the problems exist, but they're much more manageable. And in fact, in a second, I'll talk about something we've just come out with that we think makes a difference. Most personal video is not DRM. There are format issues, though, because different cameras, different camera phones, different tablets have different formats associated with them. And there are technology compatibility issues, but they are solvable. And in fact, uh, the product that Real has announced uh, uh, a, a few months ago uh, is a major step forward. It's called Real Player Cloud. We launched it in the US uh, in uh, the, uh, late in fall, just uh, late October, and we are now bringing it around the world. So today, for the first time, Real Player Cloud is available uh, to any consumer around the world. And what it does is it takes video from whatever device you have, and we support about uh, 10 different devices at this point, uh, PCs, Macs, tablets, phones, much of TV-attached devices like Roku and uh, uh, Google Chromecast and more to come. Uh, and it, there's the basic web browser as well, well any device supports a web browser. And we allow you to take video, upload it to the cloud, store it in the cloud, and then we automatically make several versions of it so we guarantee that it'll be compatible and play on any device that you have, or if you want to share the video with friends and uh, other people, it'll play on their devices. Now, we give, as part of the model, every consumer gets two gigabytes of cloud storage free. Uh, and because we think the DLD uh, community is such an important community, we're giving everybody in DLD 100 gigabytes free uh, permanently. That's a product that normally uh, costs $100 a year, uh, and we're providing that uh, in perpetuity for all DLD uh, participants. If in your bag, the, 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 the uh, backpacks that we got, there's a little tag on there. Uh, if for some reason you get a tag, find me and I'll, I'll get you one. Uh, but it's, a, with, it's for all attendees, uh, and we're doing it because we want this group of creative people, experiment people, to try this product, use it, give us feedback on it, help us make it better. But we think we have solved a fundamental problem uh, on the personal video side and on video that's not DRM. So that's a major step forward, and it's available now on Real.com. Uh, and uh, try it, check it out, let us know what you think about it, and uh, hopefully you'll begin sharing. Uh, we are in, the, in the US initial trial, we have about half a million people that have been using the product, and it's off to a, a great start. Uh, and uh, we think uh, in, the, in the months ahead, many, many millions more people will use it, and hopefully you all will, will be early adopters and will enjoy the, uh, the full experience. So well, that kind of takes us to the present. Now, for the future, wanted to talk about this dichotomy between the personal video and professional video, because to me, getting that resolved in a good way for consumers, for creators, for everybody, is a fundamentally important shift. And I'm going to issue a, a, a prediction here, which in, in five years, at the 15th anniversary of DLD, we can come back and look at the, whether the prediction was accurate or premature or just wrong. Uh, and that prediction is very simple, that uh, within five years, all commercial video will be available in a DRM-free format, with the only exception being uh, video that is part of a subscription, you know, like a Netflix subscription, or if you, get, if you have subscription pay TV. That video you're not permanently owning, so that will be in a protected format. But for any video you own, uh, or, you're, or you're buying your personal copy of, that will be DRM-free. Now, there's reason to believe that this is actually going to happen, even though it's really not on the agenda of the industry right now. 
The, reason, the biggest thing I would say is I saw this happen in music. Uh, for a long time, uh, the music industry forced purchasers to buy DRM content. And we started a campaign ourselves, a number of other companies. The result being, uh, starting about three or four years ago, the music industry flipped, and now purchased music is purchased in this DRM-free uh, uh, format. Uh, and the, the music industry uh, has, has, has found that it has actually more satisfied customers, and there's all kinds of other opportunities for a monetization opened up by that. So we, we believe that's going to happen, and frankly, that's the only way to solve this compatibility problem for having these towers of, uh, of incompatible video that will make digital video fully live up to its potential uh, to be this uh, uh, life-connecting uh, life thing that will connect us all together. Thank you all very much.